The shock of the explosion shattered the car windows. It roared on and on, vibrating through my chest like a rocket leaving a launch pad. The oscillations pressed against my skin, filling every part of my consciousness with roaring waves and then secondary and tertiary explosions. Welcome to your online coffee break, where we discuss bite-sized topics that inspire, educate, and entertain. Here's your host, a software innovator, award-winning marketer, and astronomy and space buff, Chuck Fields. Hello, thanks for joining us today for your online coffee break. Today, I'd like to welcome to our show my special guest, Mary Robinette Koal. Mary Robinette is a novelist, professional puppeteer, and an incredible voice actor. She's also a cast member of the award-winning podcast, Writing Excuses, and a three-time Hugo Award winner. Mary Robinette is with us today to discuss the Lady Astronaut Duology, an amazing science fiction series that takes us on an alternate timeline after a meteor strike in the 1950s threatens the future of humanity. Thanks for joining me today, Mary Robinette. Thanks for having me, Chuck. I'm delighted to be here. Oh, it is a pleasure. You've had a, a really busy summer. Um, we met, fortunately, at the Parker Solar Probe launch down at Kennedy Space Center, which is wonderful. But also the summer, you released these two awesome books, <laughs> The Captain <laughs> Stars and The Faded Sky. Oh, my gosh, almost back to back. Can you give our audience just a brief synopsis, because you can explain a little bit more than I can, about these books? If you had to describe to a total stranger what they're about, what would you say? The way I describe it to total strangers is it's like hidden figures meets deep impact. So it's 1952 Apollo era science fiction that's women centered and begins with a, a literal bang. I, I talk about the meteor in the first the meteorite in the first line. Oh, I was going to say, as, as an amateur astronomer, I love how you distinguish between asteroid, meteor and meteorite. <laughs> yeah. There's a big difference. And if you don't know what it is, well, you're just going to have to read the books to find out on this one, too. <laughs> Now, I guess duology, so that means this is it. There are only two books in the series. There will not be a sequel. So there are certainly more stories that I want to write in the Lady Astronaut universe. Uh, there's some short stories, and there are, in fact, going to be two new novels. Uh, this is uh, This has not... As at the time that we were recording this, this has not yet been announced. Um, so I'm going to hold back the names. Uh, but uh, but I do feel comfortable now telling you that, yes, there are going to be two new two new books. Um, they And that that is all I'm going to say right now. But yes. That's OK. That's exciting. Thank you for sharing that with us. I have to say that one thing that really impressed me the most is you obviously did a lot of research for these books. Um, the main character, she, she's a pilot. She's a physicist. Uh, she's a wife obviously. And uh, what impressed me is just how much uh, physics was in the book. I mean, it wasn't overwhelming. Um, and then how much about the weather uh, predictions. Was in it. So how on earth do, do you just know this? Are you that smart? Or did you have to do a lot of research to come up with the accuracy for them? I hired people. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> um, yeah, I basically, my theory is uh, the same that Jim Henson had, which was that he's always said that the secret to his success was that he hired people who were better than he was. Nice. So I had, um, I had a science consultant that I hired that was with me for the entire novel. His name was Stephen Grenade. Mm -hmm. Um, he's a literal rocket scientist. Um, and, uh, and fortunately for me was also, uh, majored in chemistry and can like do the math. Um, Very and nice. then I had, I had additional consultants. Uh, I had an astronomer, um, a couple of astronauts, more NASA people uh, helping me with things. Um, yeah, it was it was very much a collaborative thing getting the science right. I would say anything in there where the science is correct, mm -hmm. that is someone else, and anything where it is wrong, that is me. <laughs> oh well, I tell you, I'm just so impressed because I am a, I was always a Michael Crichton fan. And mm. of course, now I'm a Mary Robinette fan, but there, there's some similarities in the style of writing. And I, I just love just how you came in. The, the strong, uh, just the female subject is just fantastic on that. So I, I just love it. There's so many layers in this book and I, I can't highly recommend these enough. Um, I am just, I literally been reading this one every day. I'm just such a slow reader, so I'm trying to get through it, <laughs> but it's fantastic. Now you've written tons of short stories, um, mm -hmm. moving on to novels, several awards. Uh, where did your passion for writing come from? I was one of those kids who wanted to do everything and writing was a way that I could 
you know, tell stories. Ultimately, when it comes down to it, I'm a storyteller. The puppetry is a form of storytelling, audiobook, narration, acting, that's all storytelling. Uh, teaching actually is a way of storytelling. It's mm-hmm. a way of taking information and breaking it into stories that people can understand. But but the thing about fiction and science fiction and fantasy in particular is that it is allows you to take the the kind of natural world, tip it to the side and, and sort of understand the connective tissue better. Um, plus, you know, I just also like space. <laughs> so this too, is, obviously. this is also a, yeah, yeah. Um, this is also a way to, uh, to indulge in my natural curiosity in ways that are socially acceptable. Um, like I'm, I'm often sitting down having a conversation with someone and they'll say something. I'm like, uh, just give me a second while I write that down. I'm totally going to steal that later. Very nice. Let me ask this, and, and this is testing my memory, which needs a lot of testing in here. I thought I overheard when we were down in, in Florida on the bus ride touring Kennedy Space Center that your voice was played on board the International Space Station. Is that That's correct? right. That is correct. Tell us I'm more sad. about that. That is so I'm incredible. St- I'm still so geeked out about this. Okay, so this allows me to do a number of different name drops, which also I am... Go uh, right ahead. I am, so welcome to the world's longest humble brag. Um, <laughs> I was, uh, I was, I was the narrator for um, for an audiobook. I, I mean, a lot of audiobooks actually at this point. But anyway, I was talking to a friend of mine who happens to be an astronaut, and um, and he was saying that we were comparing notes about audiobooks and things that we'd le- enjoyed listening to. And he, he mentioned Neil Stevenson's Seven Eves, hmm. and I'm like, I I was the narrator for that. Nice. And he had listened to it before we met. And he's like, really? I, I listened to that. I'm like, yeah, no, that was, that's me. That's my voice. He's like, I listened to that while I was on the ISS. Wow, wow. And I'm like, <laughs> my voice has been in space. My voice has been in space. My voice has been in space. And uh, he, according to him, my, I basically shut down for about two minutes. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> Only two it's minutes. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> that is just so amazing. I was so, when I remember that, I'm like, is that really true? And it's just so yeah. neat to hear it. I cannot yeah. imagine how you felt on that. And oh my gosh, folks, let me tell you, your audiobooks are amazing. Because I was listening to the audiobook for the Calculating Stars and the way you do all the characters, uh, even the guys, Nathaniel. Oh my gosh, you just nail all these characters. Um, and then and there's a scene, you know, we have uh, Asian and just, just all the different types of personalities out there and you nail all of them how on earth did you get into audiobooks that's incredible well thanks um and thank you for all of the compliments sure. I, i'm just like g- keep talking chuck please keep talking uh, they are well deserved um, <laughs> trust me they're awesome <laughs> um again this is this is i was the kid who wanted to do everything so uh when i was in college i was an art major with a minor in theater and speech so i actually got training in voice acting and in college, I also used to compete in forensics, so speech debate and interpretive reading. So I competed. I was you know, a competitive interpretive reader and then t- channeled all of that into puppetry and then came back from puppetry after doing decades in that field to use all of those sk- skills again when I was when I was reading audiobooks. I sometimes describe audiobooks as like puppetry without the pain. That's a good description. Mm, so there's pain understand. involved because I want to talk to you about puppetry too. There is um, so much pain involved in puppetry. Oh, well, I understand you took that up in high school and I know you went on to perform for Jim Henson Productions, Sesame Street, and you own mm-hmm. your own company. I believe it's called Other Hand Productions. Yes. Walk us through how did that develop into a career? Yeah. Again, um, in high school, kid who wanted to do everything. I was in the, the local church puppet troupe and thought it was a good hobby. You know, because, you know, I would watch Sesame Street, but we all know that Sesame Street is run by volunteers because we see that at every pledge break. So, of course, I thought the puppeteers were volunteers, too. Huh. Huh. And then, uh, then I was in college doing a little shop of horrors uh, and I was the giant man eating plant and a professional puppeteer came to see the show. And I'm like, wait, people pay you to do this and basically changed career choices on the spot. I wow. interned with her, and then I went on to the Center for Puppetry Arts in Atlanta, Georgia, interned there, uh, and then I just started working and 
touring. Most of it was, um, the bulk of my career was touring to elementary schools. Uh, then doing some television, some film. Uh, I tr- I don't tour to elementary schools anymore. And Other Hand Productions has not had a formal show in at least five years. Mm. My, my partner kept getting cast in things like, you know, Avenue Q. Okay. <laughs> so it was hard to convince him to go back to the elementary schools after that, strangely. Yeah, that would be tough. <laughs> now, if you had to pick a favorite between writing, puppetry, voice acting, uh, what would you think? It's always the one that I'm not doing right now. Um, okay. <laughs> which, Fair enough. <laughs> uh, but puppetry will always have my heart. It is, for me, it is it is a complete art form. Hmm. Um It is the one where I get to express uh, kind of every facet of what I'm interested in. It's visual, it's kinetic, it's language, it's audience. Uh, I I find it fascinating and endlessly compelling. I love the way in order to really, we, we say in puppet theater that the difference between a puppet show and playing with dolls is that one of them has an audience Hmm. and and this is true of a lot of art forms, that the audience is really the thing that makes it come alive. But it is especially true in puppetry, because without the audience agreeing that the inanimate object that I have in my hands is a breathing character, that play does not move forward. But because they invest part of themselves in that character, we are able to, and I think invest a little bit more than they would when it's, as we say, a meat actor, mm-hmm. we're able to manipulate the audience more. And that sounds very um, crass to say manipulate the audience, but that is oh, what we do. Would. Yeah, that's what we do in, in theater. That's what we do in books. Uh, we We try to provoke a specific emotional state. And I think it's in many ways easier with puppetry because the audience has already taken the investment of meeting us halfway. This is kind of a, might be a hard question to answer, but as far as all the characters you developed, especially in regards to puppetry, is there one that stood out as being the most uh, close to home or the most rewarding that you've created? That's, uh, that is a difficult question because, uh, um, you know, it's a, it's like a 25 year career. Uh, the, the one Um, I I would say that the two that I, I, well, three, okay, no, I'm not going to be able to answer this question. Um, (laughs) I keep returning to, um, the, the one that I enjoy probably the most is the one that is least like me, I think, which is Audrey two and little shop of horrors. Hmm. Uh, there's the, the sheer physicality of the role. I love a great deal. It's great music. It's just a great show in terms of characters. Um, the characters are not characters that you're. Uh, your listeners would have heard of uh, one is Gerta in the Snow Queen, and um, so Gerta is very sweet and innocent, and and also very driven by the fact that she's very loving and cares. And even though everything is uh, frightening, she still goes out and and tries to succeed, and and I I love that about her. So that's Gerta, nice. um, and and then. The other one would be uh, Lee, and Lee is kind of my current active puppet. Hmm. Um, I do a, a, I say I do a web series, I think it has f- three or four episodes right now called um, Ask a Puppet, hmm. where you can ask a puppet questions about literature or life or what have you. And Lee is, Lee is a little bit raspier and... Uh, so, hi, I'm Lee. Hi, you Lee. can ask me questions and stuff. You know, I'll answer them. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm non-binary, so I use they and them. Thank you. Uh, I have a sparkly dress that I like sometimes, but I also have some denim. And I have, um, I have some other things that I'm pretty fond of. Like, I have a Ray costume, which is awesome because Star Wars is so cool. Yes. Oh, Lee. So, there you go. Honored to have Lee um, here. Do you, think, yeah, do you think the reason you enjoy someone the most is because they are the ones that are more opposite of who you are? You know, it's difficult to answer that as well, because I do put a little bit of myself in all of the characters. And I sure. think every actor does right. with, um, with Gerta, the thing that I like about her is, um, that she proceeds despite her fear. 
And I think yeah. that that is something that is actually a really valuable tool for people that it's okay to be afraid of something and keep going. And I think that's the way a lot of us proceed through our day, that there's stuff that frightens us that we just never admit outside out loud. And, uh, and I love that she keeps going. Lee, I enjoy because <laughs> Lee allows me to say things that I would not otherwise be allowed to say. Uh, that I is another thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a that's another very appealing aspect of of puppetry is that people will allow you to get away with stuff. Lee curses, and I I, I did not curse because I, I'm like I don't know your audience. Let me be polite. Thank you. We uh, appreciate but, that. <laughs> but that's why there's the edit button on here too. On that, have you? I'm, I'm just curious, have you? Puppetry almost sounds a lot like, almost like improv. I don't. Do you ever? Mm, yeah, there is puppet improv. Uh, the stuff that I do. Mm, most of my career has been scripted puppetry. Okay. I've done some puppet improv, um, mm-hmm. but uh, but I, I came from a uh, came from a scripted theater background, and that tends to be what I gravitate towards. Lee is somewhat more improvisatory because I'm I'm answering questions. Okay. Uh, and and so those are off the cuff. I don't script my answers to those. Obviously. Um, but other, I think. Yeah, I can only think of a couple of other characters where it's been improvis- completely improvisatory characters or, or scenarios. Most of it's been scripted. Okay. But uh, uh, one of the things that a lot of people will encounter in terms of seeing puppetry are um, uh, ventriloquists. Right. And ventriloquists come much more from the stand-up comedy uh, tradition. They do these days, sure, yes. Yeah, so they they are going to be very much more in the uh, combination of scripted and uh, off-the-cuff material than the stuff that I do. Okay. Yeah, I just wonder, because I, I actually did improv for a while a few years ago, just yeah. just for fun, just for fun. And it was neat, because you, you always take a little bit of yourself in, in the characters, but it, it was mm-hmm. nice and very rewarding to step outside into a character that's totally outside who you normally are. Like, this is the box that Chuck lives in, getting outside yeah. that box, and it's just a, a freer way. But I still, I love how, how you just got into character and your voice. I just think it's amazing. So I, I want to talk space for a second. And then yes. we'll let you go because we're very busy. We honestly, this was awesome. We we went to oh, the, the Parker Solar Probe launch. Was that your first time at a NASA social or it was at a my launch? Second. Second. Okay. Uh, second NASA social, se- second launch. Yes. Well, my 2.5 launch. Um, yes. So my first, my first launch was the penultimate shuttle launch. And uh, I went to that. It coincided with the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America uh, n- annual convention. And so we, we timed it to be in Orlando with the, the shuttle launch. Good idea. And fortunately, the launch went on time. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was amazing yes. um, and really emotional. And then uh, the previous NASA social that I did was for the um, commands. It was a resupply. So okay, CRS think, mission. Yeah. CRX 11. And, uh, and that was unfortunately scrubbed because a lightning strike right before, oh. right before oh, it was so close and uh, so scrubbed. And I had to, I had to leave because my writing career meant that I had to be at a convention. And so I, I couldn't stay for that one. Mm-hmm. So with hours, I was like, I have to, I'm, I have to go directly from here to Worldcon, And if it means that I do not stop at home to pick up clean clothes, I will just wash my clothes in <laughs> at the convention in a sink. That is dedication <laughs> for you folks. Dedication. That is right. I, I would have actually just gone to a laundromat, but still. <laughs> The idea is there. What did you think of the Parker Solar Probe launch? Oh, it was amazing. I was, um, it feels funny describing it to you because, of course, you were there too. I was there. Um, it was amazing. Yeah, it was just stunning. Well, I mean, the, how's it going to influence your writing? Yeah, so the interesting thing about that, I was, I was actually just talking about this at an event. Mm-hmm. Like, I have written about night launches. Um, I have read a lot about night launches. Mm -hmm. I have talked to people who have attended them and it is nothing like actually being there. And the things like I, I was aware of my consciousness kind of splitting into two levels, one, which was just trying to be there. And another of which was taking notes. Like I had heard about the way there's a moment in a night launch with a, a 
big rocket where the sky goes briefly blue. But I wasn't prepared for that. I wasn't prepared for, even though I, I had seen a launch before, I, I knew how bright they were. Mm -hmm. and, and I knew that you saw the ignition before you could hear it. But I was not prepared for the length of time uh, and, and the way the base of the rocket just goes red and it's like dahlias that are incandescent come up the sides of it oh. in a wreath and it takes off. And then there's this this moment when the, the sound first begins to reach you, this low rumble, and it creeps closer and then it's hitting you in the chest. And then and, and it's still so bright and loud and just surrounding you with the sound. And I had no idea. No one had mentioned how long you could hear the rocket. I think when we saw the shuttle launch, either the direction of the wind or the fact that it was a daytime launch and there were more people around. But but with this, you know, we could hear it five minutes after that left. Mm -hmm. and And it was still brighter than the stars in the sky, even though it had dwindled to the point of a star. It, I have never... Like all of these things are things that I'm, I can put into into the books, and I can say those words, but they're not the same as being there, and and I guess that's the, that's the thing that is is frustrating about being a writer. Sometimes it's like I want I want people to experience that, and and so sometimes I feel like the best thing that I can do is not actually convey it, but convey enough of it that someone will go. That they'll they'll it's like go sign up for NASA social just drive down to Florida, uh, you know go watch a launch or you know go through training and become an astronaut whatever it is it's like I feel like that that being a bridge between my experience and your potential future experience that's that's like the best thing that I can can try to accomplish. Well, I tell you, just hearing you. As a wonderful, accomplished writer, describe the launch. Just the words you use sort of painted the picture for me right here. I felt like I was back there. So uh, I am looking forward to see how this does impact your, your writing in the future. I, I know I just appreciate you taking time out of your hugely busy schedule to join us today. I wish you the best of luck with your, your writing, your puppetry, your voice acting, everything. Thank you so much, Brian Robinett. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Chuck. It was And it was great seeing you again. I hope that we are at another launch in the future. That sounds awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks. Online Coffee Break. Well, I really enjoyed our conversation with Mary Robinette today. Her new books from the Lady Astronaut series are amazing. I highly re recommend them. If you'd like to visit her website to find out more, you can visit her website, maryrobinettecowell.com. That's M-A-R-Y-R-O-B-I-N-E-T-T-E-K-O-W-A-L.com. I want to thank her for joining us today. I want to thank you, our audience, for joining us today as well. If you'd like to comment on today's topic, just go to our website, onlinecopyright.com, leave a comment there, or give us a call at 317-862-4700. Leave a, a message there. We just might share it on the air. If you'd like to follow us on Facebook or Instagram, just search for Online Coffee Break. And of course, we'd love it if you would subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. Also appreciate it if you'd rate us on iTunes or share this episode with your friends. Thanks so much for joining us today. See you next time. God bless.